I should say at the start that the term liberal intervention here refers essentially to liberal states, the intervention of liberal states, because one can argue whether some of the actions are particularly liberal, but it's the liberal states, essentially the West, essentially under American leadership, that I'm talking about in the post-Cold War era uh, in the Horn of Africa. Now let me start um, by quoting a piece from Africa Confidential, something you may know, uh, which in 2009 wrote, the most dangerous corner of Africa is its northeastern horn, where instability reigns and terrorism thrives and the, on, on the antagonisms of its governments. So this is what I want to explore, uh, the temptations for intervention and the role of the Western powers, the liberal states, in that intervention. So a few words first about um, the Horn of Africa itself, just so we know what we're talking about. At its core, its centre, is Ethiopia, which stands out very distinctly from all other African states. Uh, it's a highland country, never colonised, uh, essentially an, agri an agricultural community, an agricultural society, settled agricultural society, uh, dating back over centuries, and regarding itself as an empire, an expanding empire. Nothing else like it survived through the colonial period anywhere else in Africa. So Ethiopia, this highland core of now some 80 million people plus, big population, is the central actor uh, in, the, in the region. But it's surrounded by pastoral societies, or societies that historically were pastoral, that tended to be Islamic in character, whereas Ethiopia retained its old Coptic Christian church. Um, and these central actors today, in this respect, include Eritrea, um, which once was part of Ethiopia, uh, the two Sudans, uh, and Somalia, and a tiny country of Djibouti, which we'll touch on. Now, these are all much more thinly populated they still have considerable pastoral populations. They're the most pastoralized parts of the world uh, at the present time. Um, and they and their adjacent areas are sometimes referred to as the Greater Horn, including Kenya, Uganda, that often get drawn in to the activities that we think of as relating to the Horn. But the core of it is Ethiopia and the relations of Ethiopia with the states uh, around it. It's an area that's intruded considerably into political studies more generally, the more international character, through the various crises that have been thrown up um, down the years. So that <clears throat> in your concerns with policy studies, you'll find a number of areas in which aspects of the horn get brought in. Refugee studies, for instance, which took off in Oxford University in particular in the 90, early 1980s, uh, featured very largely the various refugee communities in the Horn. There are still large refugee communities of various kinds around the Horn of Africa. They tend to change with the political uh, landscape. Famine studies also got considerable attention uh, here, particularly as a result of the famine of uh, Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia, in the early 1980s, which got much international attention, band aid and all that kind of stuff, all really comes out of the Ethiopian and Sudan uh, famines of the, um, the early 1980s. And then the range of conflicts that have gone on across the region have seen it appear regularly in various studies of conflict and conflict resolution, and more recently on post-conflict um, rebuilding. So all that literature often has Horn of Africa examples um, in it. More recently, terrorism has become another theme that's developed across the academic uh, area, and um, the, the Horn of Africa plays its part too in terrorism most recently with regard to Somalia, but other times as well and elsewhere in the region. And perhaps the latest to have its own little area of studies has been piracy, um, where we've had the growth of piracy off the Somali coast. Um, and I noticed one or two conferences of Somali studies popping up and books on, on piracy generally of a comparative character, including the Somali example. So it's impinged on a lot of policy study areas of an international character because it's had so many of the crises and problems that are associated with the, the needs, possibly, of intervention. What kinds of intervention can be taken 
um, and uh, what, uh, what have the effects been. Well, what I'm really wanting to talk about this afternoon is the various kinds of intervention that have taken place and what the effect has been and the extent to which that kind of intervention is still part of public policy um, or not. Now, I should say that although I'm talking primarily about the period after the end of the Cold War, this is not the beginning of intervention. Uh, interventionism of various kinds has been going on around the Horn, as of most of Africa and the Middle East, um, for a very long time. Not just by Western colonialists, but uh, there was 19th century Egyptian ambitions that took Egypt to try to create an empire in the region without success. And then, of course, we did have um, colonialism. Ethiopia remained independent. The rest of the states were divided up between various um, powers. Britain playing a large part, um, the Italians also being present in a very small um, French outpost at uh, Djibouti. The Cold War was another period of intervention that uh, had big effects across the Horn of Africa, largely because this part of Africa is strategically important, um, especially the Red Sea and the back door to the Horn, um, sorry, to the Gulf. Um, and the oil producing areas of the Gulf. And as a result, there was very high activity in the Cold War in this area. It's the only area of the world, I think, in which the countries involved in the Horn, or the Greater Horn, changed sides regularly during the course of the Cold War. Um, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan um, were all on both sides at different times during the course of the Cold War. The Americans had control of all three at one, one time or another, or tried to have control. Uh, the Soviets uh, were their rivals and also had periods of when they controlled the, the area or tried to. So interventionism is nothing new. It happened in the imperial era. It happened in the, uh, in the Cold War era. But at the end of it, we had the Western victory. We had the New World Order. And how did the New World Order um, change the perceptions that were held particularly in the West of this region of repeated crises and what it could do, what forms of intervention um, might take place. Well, the first um, theme I want to look at, it's themes I want to do this by, uh, was essentially that of military interventions, the military interventions that have taken place, um, their forms at different periods. Now, one might have thought that militarily this was not going to be a particularly significant area compared with, say, the Middle East. And yet, in a sense, it was a successful intervention in the Middle East which spurred um, New World Order thinkers to turn towards military intervention in the Horn. The success was the expulsion of the Iraqi army from Kuwait uh, in 1991, if I remember rightly, with comparative ease, seeming to show just how effective the use of military power, particularly American-led military power, in the world could be in resolving immediate um, crises. Because a humanitarian crisis popped up shortly after that in the Horn of Africa, uh, centered on Somalia um, and on famine in Somalia uh, and on the intervention um, of various forms of bandits, groups of bandits, in the free operation of the humanitarian groups trying to relieve uh, famine, famine relief. And this appeared to, to be an easy operation. Certainly George Bush Senior, when he was president, um, saw it as an easy option. The military were very keen to show that having succeeded in uh, Kuwait and uh, liberated uh, that country from Iraq's rule, then the way would be open to use it in other parts of the world. It seemed a dead easy job. Um, they, they would just put the troops on the ground. They actually arranged that the first troops arriving were being filmed by CNN and other, ski, other, other um, American crews who were already on, on site on land, filming the brave boys coming on shore uh, to save Somalis from banditry. They had been warned, and they were warned in particular by the American ambassador to Kenya a well-known journalist in East Africa, a man called Smith Hempston, uh, who wrote uh, at the time to um, Washington, and this was leaked, if you liked Beirut, you'll love Mogadishu. And Beirut, of course, had been fighting all through the 1980s, um, and the Americans are a total mess in Beirut. 
Um, and uh, so he was warning them, but that warning was totally ignored, uh, and in they went into um, Somalia. 28,000 American troops plus 7,000 others, so it wasn't a small uh, operation, um, certainly for a place like Somalia, where the largest groups they were facing were three or 4,000 in number, um, just sort of local militias who popped up and bandit uh, banditized the, um, the uh, aid pro um, co um, the aid uh, coming in for the, for the um, for the famine. So, of course, as you know, you know the story, you may even have seen the film Black Hawk Down. A um, relatively small number of American troops were killed, but it showed they were vulnerable, and instead of being welcomed as heroes, um, they were going to find themselves stepping into a very messy situation indeed. Um, so they did uh, step into that messy situation. They lost a certain number of men, some of them extremely humiliating circumstances like Black Hawk Down itself. Um, and uh, Clinton, uh, as president, immediately did a deal with the, um, with the, uh, the rebels, the or bandits or whatever they were, IDs and his boys, um, and the Americans um, swiftly departed, um, their tails between their legs, uh, and they weren't going to be um, sending troops on the ground uh, anymore. But one of the things they had learned was essentially that you could beat standing armies quite easily, as they had done with the Iraqis in Kuwait. But when you're faced with irregular forces, militias, warlords, indeterminate groups, um, you're fighting in situations in which the societies may be under degrees of control from such local uh, warlords and leaders, where there are also sectarian and ethnic dimensions these kinds of informal wars are extremely difficult to conduct and very rarely provide you with clean um, victories. Uh, the message from the Clinton administration, no more boots on the ground in Africa. Uh, and it was notable that after he left the presidency, uh, Clinton did actually visit Rwanda and made a public apology for the non-intervention in uh, Rwanda, in the Rwanda genocide, which in part came from the experience the Americans uh, had of that first military intervention uh, in Somalia in 1993-94. Now, no boots, but doesn't necessarily mean no action. Uh, there has been some continued military action in other forms. In particular, Al-Qaeda had been growing quietly in the Horn of Africa, particularly based in uh, Sudan. And the growth of Al-Qaeda uh, led on to a number of um, activities and interventions around by Al-Qaeda attempted around the region, including uh, in Yemen, uh, the uh, attack on the SS Cole uh, in, uh, in Yemen. And uh, the result was that the Americans first put Sudan on the um, terrorism list and then produced some sanctions, of which more later. Uh, but then in 1998, they also fired some missiles um, into uh, Khartoum, the capital of, uh, of Sudan, as a way of saying, don't do this kind of thing. It was the same night that they sent missiles against uh, um, Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan and missed. Um, so a kind of attempt at um, just uh, the odd blast of missiles here and there um, was about all it was going to be, at least until after 9-11. But then in 9-11, one got back to the bigger picture of terrorism um, and terrorism as an international phenomenon, not just one in particular uh, local areas. And there was a lot of talk then of an arc of crisis, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and possibly Somalia uh, were seen as cent centers of um, Islamic terrorism, which apparently were linked up in some kind of loose connection between Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-type organizations. In Somalia, of course, they were to emerge as Al-Shabaab, or the young men, uh, a breakaway group um, in the late 19, the late uh, noughties, to, to about 2006, six seven, um, Al-Shabaab uh, first appeared on the scene. Faced with this and the unwillingness of putting boots on the ground, what was America going to do beyond um, a few uh, missiles occasionally? Well, the answer was to be um, more concerted um, anti-terrorist activity and the setting up for the first time of an American military base in the Horn of Africa at uh, a former French territory, a former French base called Camp Le Monnier uh, in uh, Djibouti. Uh, and uh, AFRICOM as a wider American uh, military attempt at uh, gaining um, control over various terrorist uh, groups. Well, um, 
That has kept boots off the ground, but it has kept American engagement in the form of drones and some special force activity, particularly uh, in uh, Somalia. Um, one or two uh, out, just outside, but on the whole, those are the areas. Of course, special forces we never know about um, officially, uh, and uh, drones we only hear about in rather disputed circumstances uh, and situations. They rise, of course, they raise, of course, particularly drones, big ethical questions with regard to policy, but I won't be so concerned with those uh, now. But they do raise the tactical questions, too, of how far the use of drones, special forces, is likely to be productive, or whether it can be counterproductive in that the collateral damage itself becomes part of the growth of the whatever opposition and resistance movement um, there may be. Um, that, of course, continues. Um, this use of drones and special forces is going on at the present time, or certainly this year um, in, uh, in that region, under the management of America's Count Le Monnier. And the other thing, of course, is to bring in local allies to try and train up local forces of your friendly neighbours um, to the particular trouble. Countries such as Ethiopia, um, Kenya, Uganda have been particularly involved in the militarisation of the attempts to crush terrorism uh, in uh, Somalia. Um, the danger here, of course, is that while that may achieve something within um, the area of Somalia, perhaps even holding the Sham al-Shabaab back, hasn't defeated them, but it may have held them back quite a bit. At the same time, it may also carry the activities of terrorists over into the countries that themselves are taking part as, as allies. So Kenya and Uganda in particular have suffered from terrorist activities which are generally associated with the situation in Somalia in, uh, in origin. Now, any other military activity? Yes, one other uh, new form of military activity, namely our friends the pirates. Um, they popped up with military activity against them. And certainly we've seen a reduction in the activities of the pirates, partly because of the military patrols of the various navies that are taking place there, and there are various navies involved, but also because the ships themselves have either taken new patterns uh, to avoid uh, the area, or themselves now have more defensive um, ways of dealing with attacks from, uh, from pirates. So it's the, it were the most recent military activity in form, um, and again, it has had the effect probably of limiting the pirates, just as al-Shabaab have been limited on land, but it hasn't had the effect of overcoming um, the problem as a whole. Uh, it still goes on being a very insecure area uh, for shipping uh, in the immediate vicinity of, um, of uh, the Somali coast. Now, let me leave um, the military, about which I've talked for too long, keeping an eye on my watch, um, and turn towards so-called soft powers. And the first soft power I want to mention uh, is that of sanctions. Um, now, we think of sanctions as being under soft power because they don't directly kill people in the way that the military um, do, but they're not always so soft. They can be quite uh, nasty in their uh, effects. One remembers, going back to the case of Iraq, the many years of Saddam's regime from um, 1991 until its downfall in 2003, during which the effect of sanctions was both to strengthen the regime, because it had control of what did get through and was available, and used that for political purposes, uh, while at the same time um, denying many things, particularly things like medicines, to many of the population, uh, and having a, a very undermining effect on the general level of what had been one of the more sophisticated countries of the Middle East. Now, back to the horn and uh, sanctions there. Well, sanctions have been aimed particularly at uh, Sudan uh, because of its involvement with uh, terrorism and its harbouring of Osama bin Laden. Um, and uh, they've been turned not only into US sanctions, but later into uh, UN um, sanctions. Um, but here, one of the limitations of sanctions uh, has been that others um, become involved and may, to some degree, fill the, uh, the space. Now, I'd be interested to hear what uh, my chairman, Dan Large, has to say about this, but in some ways I suspect that the American turning away uh, through sanctions of American e e economic activities in uh, Sudan, particularly South Sudan, where there are substantial amounts of oil, um, left the way open for the Chinese to, uh, as it were, take over uh, the patch. 
and to make what they could out of the oil available in particularly uh, South Sudan. Um, so as a, as a tool in that particular case, in Sudan's case, um, sanctions did have the effect of limiting any Western uh, intervention uh, of, a, of a, an economic character to develop uh, the area. Um, and indeed, the government in Sudan has consistently complained about being under American sanctions and wants them lifted, still does. But at the same time, um, it has uh, laid the way open for others, particularly Asian and Arab states, uh, to move into that uh, uh, territory for whatever economic opportunities there are, uh, and some have made money and some have had more trouble um, making money in, the, in that area. Um, so we can certainly say there that sanctions, as deployed in the Horn of Africa, have not been decisive. And they haven't brought regimes down, um, but they have opened up the way for the competitors to, uh, to the liberal states um, to move in economically, not only into Sudan, but in the less sanctioned area of Ethiopia, where uh, the Asian states led by China have been extremely, uh, extremely active. Sanctions on the whole then have not uh, had a, a, the degree of effect that they had in Iraq uh, in terms of the living standards of people um, in the Horn of Africa and the sufferings of the Iraqi population under sanctions in the, in the 1990s. But they are not um, with no effect at all. They have had some, uh, some effect. Now I want to turn to diplomatic um, interventions because diplomatic interventions sound always as if they should be fairly straightforward. Um, we're the good guys, we're coming in, we're trying to get two sides to sit, or more, more than two sometimes, to sit round tables, to talk to each other, to work out diplomatic solutions as reasonable men, generally men, um, should be able to do, even if we may be the less responsible, um, reasonable gender. Um, now we've seen quite a lot of this around uh, the whole of Africa. Uh, and really at, at two levels. The, the one we probably think of most um, is in relation to internal conflicts because Africa as a whole, and the Horn in general, has had many internal conflicts and we tend to think of people sitting around diplomats trying to encourage the various sides to domestic conflicts to talk to each other. But in fact, the Horn of Africa has also been the scene of the two largest conventional intra um, state, sorry, interstate wars, conventional international wars, to take place in Africa since the end of World War II. Um, the first of those wars was the Somali-Ethiopian War of the, um, when was it, late 1970s, 77, 78, I think, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, diplomacy didn't have much uh, impact on that. The Soviets, in particular, tried to stop the Somalis from launching their attacks on Ethiopia for the return of what they claimed were their lands um, without any success. Uh, and the Ethiopian um, responded uh, with uh, Soviet help when the Soviets switched sides. And the, um, the war ended, essentially, in the downfall of the regime in uh, Somalia some years later after a long and bitter internal struggle in Somalia. But more recently, in the post-Cold War era, when a new, uh, new wave was supposed to be around, uh, it was the Eritrean-Ethiopian War. Eritrea and Ethiopia taken over by respective guerrilla forces who seemed to have liberated in the name of a bright new future against um, a communist regime. Should have been ripe for um, new world order friendship. Um, but they turned on each other at the end of the 1990s, 1998, uh, and um, started the first of what be two bitter rounds of war um, against all the efforts of American diplomats who poured in in large numbers because they really saw this as the area where they'd supported anti-Soviet um, guerrilla art forces, now in power and now fighting each other in a very uh, bitter and bloody war uh, that was rather resembled, rather resembled the trench warfare of World War of World War One, uh, the one we're mentioning uh, this uh, this year in regard to its start in 1914. So um, we had then um, big American attempts. Uh, indeed, one um, young lady, well, she was quite young, the American Under Secretary of State for Africa, Susan Rice, uh, was sent in. Um, but when she started to try to throw her weight around, and, and she didn't have much weight to throw around, 
uh, Melish Zanawi, the, Amer the Ethiopian president, just told her to get out of the room and literally throw her out. Um, and so that the Americans then tried to put in someone who was rather more diplomatic, um, but that didn't work either. The, er the Eritreans and the Ethiopians are going to go to war come what may. Well, they're not fighting at the moment, but they haven't resolved it, and both sides keep very large armed forces along that border between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and in large part it seems to be part of the excuse for the political repression in both those countries that, of course, they have a danger of war with a neighbour. Uh, this is, as it were, the use of warfare for political stability in one's own country, uh, a well-known tactic of um, domestic politics, find an enemy to blame. Um, so it's been essentially uh, a more active role, and perhaps some would say the more successful role, has been in relation to internal conflicts within the, the states in the Horn of Africa, uh, where there have been um, repeated efforts. Uh, some of the best known ones um, have been the ones in uh, Sudan and in Somalia, uh, because these were two areas that were riven for decades by uh, local conflicts of one kind or another. And in these, um, we saw repeated efforts, and I mentioned my own practical involvement in the 90s. I think I was involved in three efforts of uh, peace negotiations with, uh, with Sudan, um, which all came uh, to nothing. Um, until 2005, uh, which I wasn't involved in, when the, uh, perhaps that's a good reason, uh, the CPA, the Convention, uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement, was signed between uh, Sudan and the then rebel movement, the, South, the Sudan People's Liberation Army, which then decided to take its option of secession uh, in 2011. Uh, so we now saw a apparently peacefully divided um, two Sudans. But um, divided it was, and divided essentially out of the result of what seemed to be quite a successful diplomatic effort. And yet at the same time, it wasn't the diplomatic effort that was able to end conflict. Because alas, conflict, uh, in fact, developed faster in some parts of what is now Sudan, Darfur, and in two areas on the South Sudan, Sudan border, but in Sudan itself, areas of Blue Nile and Nuba Mountains, uh, which are still ongoing. We haven't heard much about Darfur for a good while, but it's still, it's still out there, it's still area in conflict. So we still have areas of conflict in uh, Sudan with repeated efforts, again, at diplomatic intervention, but without uh, success so far. Meanwhile, as you may know, this year in South Sudan, there's been a dreadful um, conflict ongoing between different groups and factions in, uh, in that new state, the world's newest state, been riven by, uh, by warfare. And the diplomats haven't been able to do much on that at the moment, although they're trying hard, particularly the uh, African diplomats, and talks have been going on in um, Addis Ababa for most of this year. Uh, and indeed, yet another uh, agreement was announced in the last few days, but we've had many agreements, and the conflicts have so far um, continued. So diplomacy. Uh, it takes actually quite a lot, not only of efforts by diplomats, but the circumstances on the ground have to be um, willing to produce results. If Basically, if the combatants are not prepared to be negotiated, they won't be. Or if they will be, it'll be a temporary uh, affair rather than uh, a, a lasting um, uh, outcome. Um, there's no as it were, straightforward route of reasonable men sitting around under international leadership um, to see that really there is uh, a way forward um, against what they may perceive as their own interests. And their interests may be very different to those being pursued by the international um, diplomats. Other forms of intervention. Um, aid. Aid has come in, of course, as a big um, theme ever since World War II, really, in different parts of the world. Um, but with regard to this area and the period I'm talking about, we can think of humanitarian uh, aid, first of all. I've mentioned already Somalia and the difficulties of humanitarian aid in Somalia that the Americans encountered in '93, And on and off, depending essentially on issues such as drought, that has continued. And uh, Somalia itself, of course, has suffered drought in the last two or three years and issues of access for humanitarian food supplies have been as great now as they were when the Americans went in in, in uh, 1993. 
uh, and it's still required um, for areas, although it still runs into the political problems of where uh, areas under al-Shabaab control um, may make life difficult for deliveries of humanitarian aid. Sudan also experienced during its period of war from the late 1980s right through until um, the peace agreement of 2005, Operation, Liber um, Operation uh, for South Sudan, OLS, uh, which produced regular humanitarian food aid for years into South Sudan and parts of North Sudan as well, what is now uh, Sudan. And that just went on and on and on. Um, and uh, indeed in South Sudan, though it's no longer OLS, not the same operation, uh, UN food operations are vital for up to two million people, last estimates, uh, heavily dependent, and with the fighting it will be worse. Um, and with the fighting not only um, because of the immediate uh, suffering, but because of the way in which it intervenes with the possibility of planting for next season, so there's going to be continuing food shortages across um, much of South Sudan, as well as, of course, in the war-affected areas of um, Sudan itself. Somalia then and Sudan's remain um, particularly um, suffering. And of course, a part of this is that uh, some, at least of this humanitarian food aid, one always has to recognize, does go to the combatants and helps to keep the combatant, uh, the combats going, um, because the combatants can access uh, food supplies are coming in from the name of relief. Indeed, for most agencies, it becomes a kind of trade-off. If we don't do it, people suffer. If we do do it, then the combatants will also um, receive some of this aid um, one way or another, and it will help to keep them going and therefore keep conflicts going. It's a continuing dilemma for those distributing uh, food relief uh, into combat areas. And then... Of course, the hope is that there can be development, because development is what we ought to be wanting. Development is what uh, aid agencies would like to be doing, rather than just um, looking after uh, humanitarian uh, needs. And uh, this can go into various areas. Obviously, infrastructure uh, can be an important one. Services uh, can be another. Um, but they have their problems, um, infrastructure, it's going to change the, the nature of activities, it's going to allow people particularly to move from uh, rural to urban areas, perhaps increase urban densities which take place across Africa, with no exception in the Horn of Africa. Huge cities like Addis Ababa now and, the, and uh, Khartoum, uh, the numbers of uh, refugees in and around a centre like Juba, the newest capital in South Sudan. So that problem uh, is always going to be there. And with regard to developing services, the extent to which the services themselves delivered internationally will be seen by local governments as an alternative to provision uh, from the, on their own um, behalf. The UN um, in uh, Sudan, South Sudan last, earlier this year was protesting vigorously that the government seemed to regard it as the natural police force for the country rather than trying to do very much to build its own police force, just hoping to rely on the UN to do the job which it obviously wasn't designed to do and hasn't been able to do in terms of the um, provision of any kind of security system, even not just in conflict areas, but more broadly across this newest state. But perhaps above all, with regard to development, the hopes in the new world order as a whole that um, good governance was going to emerge. Um, and of course, being a, by background a, a, a political scientist, as we're called, um, good governance was a concern. Occasionally I got involved in good governance type projects and activities. Um, on the whole, uh, the good governance outcomes have been pretty limited uh, across the Horn of Africa. In particular, I mentioned there were great hopes as the Americans supported the liberation forces in Ethiopia and Eritrea that they were going to produce democratically inclined revolutions. They haven't. They've produced autocrats. Um, and they're autocrats who, again, decisions have been made in Washington and elsewhere that if they're good autocrats, uh, then we'll support them, as in Ethiopia. If they're bad autocrats, as in Eritrea, uh, then we'll try and sanction or whatever uh, we have in, uh, in our hands um, to try to, to limit the power. 
But in reality, both uh, those two countries have become more and more autocratic, while the agreement in Sudan and South Sudan um, of 2005 was not only a peace agreement, it was also supposed to be the introduction of free and fair democratic elections in both those countries. In reality, what happened was that the two main combatant parties, essentially armed camps, now became as the dominant political parties of their countries, their respective countries, and they've gone on um, in that kind of autocratic uh, way, producing, again, the new combat um, areas of uh, North Sudan and uh, South Sudan um, since the uh, peace agreement of 2005. So if one's looking towards um, good governance in terms of um, a liberal democratic model, um, then on the whole it hasn't fallen on very um, receptive ground. Manish Sanawi, when he was president, the late president, no, president, beg your pardon, prime minister of Ethiopia, uh, was very dismissive of it, preferring a more Chinese model of development, uh, as he repeatedly said to all who would um, listen uh, to him. Um, if one wants to see uh, uh, the nearest thing to uh, a democratic order uh, evolving in the Horn of Africa, you have to turn to a state you never heard of because it doesn't exist, except it does exist, and its name is Somaliland, and it's the old British territory of Somaliland which wishes its independence, but which the international community will not give it independence to, because the African Union runs scared of the outcome of uh, giving independence to uh, Somaliland. South Sudan was different. And Somaliland has actually changed government twice at the ballot box, um, which is quite an achievement and is generally more open um, and, if you like, towards the democratic direction uh, than anywhere else in, the, uh, in this immediate uh, region. E e e Neighbouring Kenya, of course, has got some kind of democracy, but um, across in Uganda you find another autocrat who came to power by the barrel of a gun uh, and re retains his autocratic uh, tendencies. The uh, Somaliland delegation to the independent celebrations in South Sudan in 2011 wore T-shirts saying, we're next. And they should have been before, uh, before South Sudan because there was far more of a state in Somaliland than there was in South Sudan, which really had nothing uh, and still has, well, has less than nothing now because it has um, widespread and quite significant fighting. Right, Dan, I'm nearly time up, but I've got two more bits to, uh, to throw in before we get there. Um, the next one is uh, Tony Blair, <laughs> um, being British, I to mention Tony Blair. Uh, and his 1999 doctrine uh, somewhere in Canada that he came out with, that when you have um, repressive governments oppressing their peoples, then sovereignty is temporarily waived, at least temporarily waived, and there is an international right of uh, intervention called the right to protect, or R2P, as it's now known in the literature. So we have a lot of discussions of when R2P uh, can be um, uh, invoked. Um, well, uh, R2P uh, did lead to some debates, particularly about Darfur, because it came just after, or sorry, just before Darfur, Darfur crisis of 2003. A lot of talk then about R2P, um, but of course, boots on the ground in a distant place like Darfur, right out in the west of Sudan, the size of France, a huge place, um, and uh, no one was going to go there, frankly apart from the UN, who have been there trying to uh, limit the, uh, the fighting that's gone on. Um, and with the, with the UN, with the agreement of the government in Khartoum, um, no intervention against uh, the activities of the government in Darfur, or indeed much against the rebels. Essentially, they've been there to protect IDPs, internally displaced persons, of whom there are many hundreds of thousands. Uh, and that has been an enormously difficult part, task. So we're not going to uh, hear uh, too much about R2P in respect of the uh, Horn of Africa, even though there are continuing problems, some of which we'd hear little about, such as Ethiopian peasants being displaced in the name of commercial agriculture. But we won't hear much about that because Ethiopia is a good guy, nearly. Um, at least it's economically growing very fast. So R2P didn't, hasn't really taken off. And anyway, I suspect the name of Blair didn't help. Uh, in the attractions of R2P after 2003. And finally, you'll be relieved to hear the last of the forms of interventions that have gone around um, of recent times. 
the International Criminal Court, which picked up in the mid uh, noughties about 2004, five, somewhere around there, the mid, the mid noughties. And the ICC, based in The Hague, was supposed to get the bad guys um, in uh, wherever they were, actually, but they, they tend to be always in Africa for the ICC, uh, and to bring them to boot uh, and uh, before the court in, um, in The Hague. Well, the ICC's had a, a pretty checkered career um, as far as the Horn of Africa is concerned. It has had some quite high-profile cases. There was uh, attempts to uh, arrest Coney. You've heard of uh, Joseph Coney and his little gang in, uh, who used to hang out in uh, South Sudan and uh, in neighbouring Con Congo. And uh, they're, they're probably in South Sudan at the moment, I think. Last I heard, they were somewhere near the, uh, the border with Central African Republic. Um, there, but they, it's always a matter of keeping up with them. But the ICC has never managed to, to get a handle on them. Um, it then uh, decided that Bashir and Darfur was another uh, good example. So Bashir, the president of Sudan, is duly stands indicted as, as one, at least one other guy, maybe there's two or three others uh, in Sudan. But again, they can't get hold of them. Um, and uh, it, uh, it hasn't so far uh, had much uh, impact, at least as far as the Horn is concerned. Of course, there have been, under different auspices, trials going on with regard to Congo in Tanzania, but that's not actually an ICC operation. It's a slightly different um, operation. Um, has it changed behaviour? Well, there was one guy from the Congo who turned himself into the ICC not long ago and was recently uh, imprisoned, I believe. Um, but certainly President Bashir in Sudan and the other extreme, Joseph Kony, um, in wherever he is now, uh, seem to be beyond the reach of the ICC, so it doesn't seem to have had a, a big effect. Though it's had a slightly negative one in that um, Africa in particular, and the African Union, has complained about the way in which Africa seems to have been picked out in this, and they said that since most international lawyers thought that the invasion of Iraq was illegal, why don't uh, Bush and Blair find themselves before the, uh, the court? Um, that has yet to happen. It be, I'd be delighted if it did, but I'm sure it won't. Um, because they're a different, uh, different uh, situation to chaps like Kony and, and Bashir. But Bashir hasn't changed his behaviour, nor has Kony. All it's done for Bashir is mean that he can't come to Hungary and other nice countries that probably signed up. Um, he has to limit his activities and travel-wise um, to uh, places nearer to uh, Sudan and who care even less about the ICC uh, than he did. Conclusion of all this, well, there wasn't a new world order at least not as far as the Horn of Africa was concerned. Um, no quick fixes, long-term conflicts, themes of conflict, lack of development, uh, still um, well in place. What lessons do we have to learn, the liberal West have to learn from this? We don't control these situations. We may intervene in one way or another but we never finish up in controlling conditions and probably we couldn't theoretically unless we may return to, as it were, full-blown imperialism with its legal order in the international community. And that blew out of the water at the end of World War I with Woodrow Wilson uh, and the, um, the rise of, uh, of nationalisms uh, across the world. So we're never going to see that kind of imperialism with boundaries and all the rest of it and flags of European countries or America flying everywhere uh, around the world. You can influence, but that's the most you can do. And your degree of influence depends largely on an understanding of just what conditions are on the ground uh, and of um, the various problems that you're going to face. You're also going to have to recognize, coming from the liberal West, that um, there are regional actors who you're dealing with and that regional actors have their own agenda and that many of these regional actors have been in power for years and have experienced dealing with the West for far longer than any Western leaders have experienced dealing with them as individuals. Uh, Menesh Sanawi knew how to run rings around any, any politician who came near him and did it frequently. Um, he was in power until his death you know, from 1991. And the same could be said of other leaders like um, Museveni in Uganda. Uh, they've, they've got the experience, not, not the, the, the diplomats who come and go and the politicians who come and go from, uh, from outside. They operate to their own interests, um, and uh, we try to work um, around them. And then there is the wider international community, which doesn't necessarily operate any longer off the same agenda as the, uh, the winners of the Cold War, particularly uh, in Asia, who may have very different uh, ways of operation, as well as different agendas. 
uh, and who are powerful and growing in power, very often growing in power to a greater extent um, than the, the Western liberals um, are in power. And Dan can say far more about that uh, than I can. This doesn't necessarily mean that we can't continue to act in terms of liberal intervention. It just means we have to have humility, we have to have care, understanding, and far less belief that a new world order is about to come to place. Does this mean, as the Americans are often asking, that America is weaker? I don't know. It may still have the same kind of capabilities that it had before, but it doesn't have such an empty stage to act upon um, as it had once upon a time. It's acting in a much more competitive international environment than ever before, and it's acting in the situations in which those on the ground know the rules of the game as far as they're concerned on the ground far better than any outsiders do. Alas. Thank you.